Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Cross Examines the New Testament with our sweet Rebbe, Michael, the man, Skoback. Welcome back. How are you, sir? Good morning, William. Good morning from Canada, where we're celebrating Thanksgiving Day here in Canada. Turkey Day 2. <laughs> I don't know if they do Actually, turkey technically it's one because y'all beat us on the calendar. That's <laughs> <laughs> I guess we get the the glory or the lack of for for Thanksgiving too. But you said that they made it off of based on the American holidays. I don't know. I mean, I don't. I mean, Americans have a tradition, you know, the Mayflower and the turkeys and every, like the whole story that that we grew up with. I don't know if there's a story here. Um, I'm not aware of one. I, I never learned. I mean, I, I'm not from Canada. I never learned you know, any kind of origin stories for where they got Thanksgiving from. My, I suspect they got it from the United States. <laughs> right, they, right. Um, I have heard some some alternate stories about the origin of Thanksgiving in the U.S. that is quite disturbing, and I don't I don't really know which one's, which one's true or not, but uh, interesting. I don't know. Well, sometimes you have to basically say to yourself, However this got started, who cares? Um, it, it's always appropriate right now in our lives to be thankful to God. Yes, right, true. And, uh, you know, sometimes we get so bogged down in, you know, origin stories and where did things come from. Um, you know, it may have had uh, a savory or unsavory history. But to me, that's not that important. I think that, you know, we're not thanking God for what happened uh, a long time ago. We're really, we're thankful for God for what our lives are like now, what God is giving us now. And I think uh, that's the important thing. Very good. Oh, that's for me. I'll take it later. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody, please turn off your dang cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, I'll have to call you back in about an hour, okay? No worries. Thanks, thanks, boss. Bye. <laughs> usually, when I get lucky, usually, usually it rings whenever it's like I've got the microphone turned down. But no, not today, of course. Let me do this. Let me mute this mic now. There we go. Well, yeah, but whenever I'm giving a lecture nowadays, I tell people if they have weapons of mass distraction. <laughs> Put them on stunt that, or silence. That's a good one. <clears throat> that's a good one, everybody. You're funny. Okay, well, cool. So, um, Luke, see, I keep I keep wanting to go. Mark, 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 uh, Mark, Luke, chapter fourteen, uh, and we'll pass it on to you, sir. Take it away, boss. Did we do the music before the show? We, we did. Oh, <laughs> I'm thankful for my memory. Okay. <laughs> they said it's the second thing to go when you get older is your memory. Yeah, I can't remember the first one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take it away, boss. All right, so Luke 14 begins, begins with uh, a story of hospitality that Jesus is visiting the house of a Pharisee on Shabbat. And there is someone there who is sick with what they call in the in the manuscripts of the Christian Bible, sick with dropsy. Now, we don't speak about dropsy anymore. Today, it's referred to as edema. And edema is basically a painful buildup of fluid in the body. So, like many other stories that we've seen in the Gospels, for example, if you go back just to Luke chapter 6, what you have is Jesus trolling the Pharisees that are there by raising the question of whether or not it's permitted to heal on the Sabbath, on Shabbat. So basically, there is no biblical prohibition of healing on Shabbat. There's absolutely nothing in the Torah that uh, prohibits in any way healing on Shabbat. But this is something that the sages uh, instituted. The sages were basically charged with protecting, uh, putting safeguards around the biblical prohibitions. So the sages prohibited uh, administering medications because it may lead to people grinding spices and herbs, things that were 
uh, processed in order to produce medications. But it's important to understand that there are three categories of what you could call a person's health when it comes to the Shabbat laws. There's a category called Chole Sheyesh Bo Sakana, which means an, a person that's sick and they're in danger, meaning that they're, they're, their life is in danger. So when it comes to a Chole Sheyesh Bo Sakana, a sick person that's really, you know, dangerously ill, there's a threat to their life, and, you know, how this is defined, interestingly, is um, much less gravity than we would assume it is. Um, many conditions that we wouldn't assume are dangerous to someone's life, the, the, the rabbis did treat it like that. In any event, if someone is, is in a state like that, where they're considered a chola, a person that is seriously ill, it's not only that they're allowed to heal on the Shabbat, they're required to. It's a, it's a requirement, and they're even allowed to violate biblical prohibitions. So forget about overcoming rabbinic uh, prohibitions. If a person's life is in danger, you violate a biblical prohibition. The sages of Israel, they, there were verses in the Torah. For example, it says in the book of Leviticus, Vechaibahem, you should live through them, meaning you should live through the mitzvot, the commandments, and you shouldn't die because of them. And the sages of Israel taught that it is better to violate one law in the Torah and be able to live and continue observing the Torah than to die as a result of observing the Torah. So we have a principle called pikuach nefesh, that when it comes to saving someone's life, we're not just permitted to violate the Shabbat, both rabbinically and biblically, but we're obligated to. Now, there's a second level of illness, let's say, on Shabbat, that's called a chole she'en bo sakana. A person that's sick, they're sick, but they're not in danger of losing their life. So when it comes to that, the sages generally would permit administering medication. So even though medication normally is not administered, I'll explain that in a moment, but if a person is sick, they're in pain, they're really not well, so you're able to, again, heal on Shabbat using medication, which normally would not be permitted in a situation like that. Then there's a third category where the person's not sick. They're just, let's say, they're not feeling great. They're in a minor discomfort. So for people like that, um, you would not administer medication. You wouldn't do things um, that could lead to the to the biblical prohibition of grinding things for a person that's not really sick. If they're just feeling a little bit uncomfortable and they could live with that, um, then the rabbinic law would be not to administer medication. Um, meaning they're healthy. They're healthy, but they just have some minor discomfort. Now, here... In this story, in Luke chapter 14, um, as in other stories in the Gospels, Jesus' alleged healings is through speaking words and laying on of hands, which would be permitted activities. There's nothing prohibited about what Jesus did, especially in the stories of the Gospels, meaning where someone has edema, which is a painful condition, could be a serious condition, and many of the other stories of the Gospels, there'd be absolutely nothing wrong with what Jesus did, according to the Sabbath laws. Now, what's interesting in these stories, and it's interesting here as well, is that Jesus never challenges the idea that there is any problem with healing on Shabbat. He never 
says to the Pharisees, well, where in the Torah does it say you can't heal on the Sabbath? He doesn't question the idea that there is any problem with healing on the Sabbath, meaning that, again, the rabbis did put constraints around certain kinds of healing, especially when it involved administering medication. They didn't want people coming to violate the biblical Sabbath. But Jesus never challenges this rabbinic prohibition. He never says, where in the Torah, where in the Bible does it ever say you're not allowed to engage in these kinds of healing? Instead of challenging the idea, instead of challenging the rabbinic prohibition against certain kinds of healing, Jesus instead engages the Pharisees with various arguments about why the prohibition wouldn't apply. So, for example, in this passage, he engages in a form of argumentation which, unfortunately, doesn't make any sense at all. So he asks the Pharisees here rhetorically that if they had an ox or a child that fell into a well, so he asks them, would you not pull him out on the Sabbath? Wouldn't you pull your child out of the well on the Sabbath or pull your animal out of the well on the Sabbath? So the truth is that, again, there's nothing wrong. There'd be absolutely nothing wrong. There's no violation of the Sabbath in pulling a child out of a well. And even the rabbis who were very concerned with any pain that was caused to animals, there would be ways of lifting an animal out of a pit or a well on the Sabbath or a festival as well. So the problem is that in this story, like in most of the stories in the Christian Bible, uh, Jesus asks this kind of, uh, you know, uh, rhetorical question. And the text says that the Pharisees were unable to answer him. They, he sort of, he shuts them up. They weren't able to answer his question. The problem is that this is obviously a complete fiction, a very convenient fiction. I mean, again, if the gospel writers, if part of their agenda is to put down the Pharisees, so again, they would love to be able to show the Pharisees as inept, as foolish, as unable to respond to anything Jesus says. The problem is that any junior student, any sort of junior pharisaical student would have been able to answer these questions here in Luke chapter 14 and in any of the stories where he puts the, these questions to the Pharisees and he stumps the Pharisees. These are never questions that would have been difficult for anyone to answer. So it's sort of anyone with any kind of knowledge of what the Pharisees were like, these uh, you know, rabbinical Torah scholars, these stories are obviously fictional because none of his questions would stump anyone. Anyway, that's the first part of Luke 14. The next part is a passage where, um, you know, Jewish thought would not disagree. Um, he has a passage going from verses 7 to 11 dealing with honor seeking, with honor seeking. You know, Judaism never felt that it had to be in a position where literally every word coming out of the mouth of Jesus had to be refuted and had to be attacked. Um, you know, there are people like that, by the way, there are people, you know, that, uh, if they don't like you, it doesn't matter what you say, they're going to disagree. They're going to argue. They're going to say that you're wrong. Um, I remember I saw a, a meme yesterday on Facebook where someone, <laughs> someone said that, uh, you know, it, it's true that people are willing to argue about everything and it, they, they, they had a picture of a half of a glass of water saying, this is a glass of water. And then, of course, everyone starts going at each other in the comments section. Um, so there's no reason to literally um, trash everything <laughs> that comes out of the mouth of Jesus. 
again, I want to re reiterate, we don't really know anything about what Jesus said. He didn't leave any writings. All we have are what people claim that he said it may or not may or may not be true. Um, but in this short passage, uh, Jesus says, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast or some kind of a reception, do not take the place of honor. Don't sit in the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you um, come, and you may have been invited by him, and he who invited you both shall, and he who invited you both shall come and say to you, give your place to this man, meaning give your place up to the person that's really a distinguished person, and then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. So this is a teaching that we see here in Luke 14 about, you know, the inappropriateness of honor seeking. And the truth is that we see a very, very similar teaching in the book of Proverbs, chapter 25, verses 6 to 7. So there, King Solomon writes, do not glorify yourself in the presence of the king and do not stand in the place of the great, for it's better that it should be said to you, come up here, than that you be demoted before the prince as your eyes have seen. Very similar to what um, Jesus teaches here in Luke 14. And the teaching here in Luke 14 is also very similar to a teaching by Rabbi Shimon ben Azai in Leviticus Rabbah, in the Midrashic text called Leviticus Rabbah, where in the Midrash, Rabbi Shimon ben Azai says, stay two or three seats below your place, meaning below the place you should occupy. Even go two or three seats below that in terms of honor and sit there until they say to you, come up. Do not begin by going up because they may say to you, go down. It's better that they say to you, go up, than that they should say to you, go down. So again, this is not any particularly unique teaching of Jesus. This is something that um, is taught in the Bible. It's taught in rabbinic traditions. I am positive that you'll find similar teachings in virtually every religion in the world. So moving on to verses 12 and 13. If you have found this channel helpful and this has blessed you or your family members in helping bring you out of idolatry, I would love to have your support. Please consider donating to this channel directly. That would be pretty awesome. Donations can be done through PayPal, Patreon, or through snail mail. The links to all are added in the video description below. You can also click this link and it will take you straight to my website with a donate button, which leads you right through PayPal. Thank you once again for your kindness and consideration for supporting this work. Blessings for you, your family, and your home. Shalom. So moving on to verses 12 and 13. He um, says, when you make a luncheon or dinner, this is Jesus teaching here, do not invite your friends, your relatives, or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and repayment comes to you. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. That's the advice of Jesus. And once again, we see parallels in Torah sources. So in Isaiah, Chapter 58, verse 7, the prophet says, Surely you should break your bread for the hungry and bring the moaning poor into your home. Or in Deuteronomy, chapter 14, verse 29, Then the Levite can come, for he has no portion or inheritance. And the proselyte, or the orphan, and the widow who are in your cities, so they may be eat and be sat satisfied. Or Job, Eov, chapter 31, verse 32. No sojourner ever slept outside. I opened my doors to the street. Now we also find parallels to what Jesus says in rabbinic liter literature. So for example, in Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers, or Chapters of the Fathers, in chapter 1, um, 
paragraph five, Mishnah number five. We have a teaching from the second century BCE, Rabbi Yossi ben Yochanan, who says, let your house be wide open and let the poor be members of your household. So again, Jesus teaching uh, ethical principles that are not unique to the Christian Bible, not unique to Christianity. In verses 16 to 24, uh, we have a parable, often called the parable of the great banquet. And again, this story now here in Luke 14 has similarities to a teaching from Matthew chapter 22 that we discussed back in our series on Matthew. So basically what happens in this story is that someone was making a big reception and they invited many people. And when the time arrived, he sent his servant out to let everyone know that the event was about to begin and they should come. They should come to the dinner. The dinner was starting. But they all began to make excuses. All of the people he invited, one said, well, I just purchased some land and I need to go out and look at it. I can't come. And another, another person said, I pur I've purchased five yoke of oxen and I have to go out and, and to try them out. And then the third one said, I just got married, so I can't just come now. Um, everyone came up with an excuse. And the slave, the servant, reported this to his master. And the master became very angry. I mean, he's getting snubbed by all of the people that were invited. So he told his servant to go out to the street and invite the poor, the lame, the crippled, the blind, and he was very, very angry with those people that he actually initially invited. So the servant did that. He invited all these people. And he comes back to the master and says, look, I invited all the people that you said now, but there's still room at the banquet. So in verse 23 here, the master says to his servant, go out into the highways and among the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. So it's interesting that David Stern, in his commentary to this passage, David Stern wrote a messianic commentary to the New Testament. So in his commentary to this passage, to verse 23, he points out that in the past, this verse that speaks about going out into the highways and hedges and among uh, the people there and compelling them to come in that my house may be filled, David Stern says that this verse was used in the past to justify forcing Jews to be baptized against their will. Of course, Stern renounces such a concept, but he says that this is how many people in the church in the past would, under, would basically use this passage. In verse 25, Luke says, Now great multitudes were going along with him, with Jesus. Great multitudes. Now we've seen numerous times in Luke's gospel that Luke says that Jesus had a huge following. And we've pointed out that this makes it impossible to square the life of Jesus with Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, the servant of the Lord is portrayed as someone who is despised and rejected of men. Despised and rejected of men. And here you have Jesus in his lifetime during his ministry as someone who is very, very popular, who attracts huge crowds, according to the Gospels. And we know, of course, that after his death, he becomes fabulously famous and popular. Um, I went to high school and we, um, you know, we, I think, uh, I don't know if we studied it, but, but there was a popular musical back then, Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, but that's what he became, a superstar, not some you know, obscure person who has been rejected and despised by everyone. So again, 
it's important to just keep on pointing this out that it's impossible to square the portrayal of Jesus in the Gospels to the way the prophet Isaiah describes the servant of the Lord. And there again, when you go through Isaiah 53, virtually every line uh, contradicts the life of Jesus. Virtually every line. In verse 26 here, Jesus turns to the multitudes and says to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Very famous passage. Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, it's interesting that back in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, Jesus commanded his followers to love their enemies. Here he's teaching them to hate his most intimate family members. But in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, he teaches his followers that they were obligated to love their enemies. Now, virtually all Christian commentaries to the book of Luke here insist that Jesus is not really teaching people to hate their families. This is something that's universally taught by all Christian commentaries, but he is rather hyperbolically teaching about the cost of discipleship. And really, it's not teaching people to hate their families, but rather the way it's explained is that he's teaching them to have less love for themselves and their families than they have for him. It's not a teaching about hate. It's a teaching about having less love for themselves and their families than they have for him. Now, arguably, there would be better ways of expressing this idea. And the sages of Israel, the sages of the Talmud, taught that wise people have to be very careful with how they express themselves. We find in Pirkei Avot, in Chapters of the Fathers, Chapter 1, Mishnah 11, where Avtalion says that Chachamim, wise people, have to be very careful with, with how they speak and how they express themselves because otherwise there could be disastrous consequences for their followers and God's name ultimately desecrated. So we would say from a Jewish point of view that you know if Jesus is trying to teach people that they need to love him more than they love themselves, there would have been better ways of expressing that than to just literally come out and say that unless you hate yourself and your mother and your father and your wife and your children and your brothers and sisters, you cannot be my disciple. That's not a very helpful way of teaching this idea. It's interesting, by the way, that in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28 to 29, by contrast there, Paul teaches that husbands should love their wives as their own flesh, as their own bodies, for no one hates their own flesh. So here you have Paul actually teaching the importance uh, that people love their wives as themselves. And also you find in 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 to 21, a relevant passage. There it says, if someone says, I love God and I hate and he hates his brother, he is a liar for the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. By the way, you see here that Jesus cannot be God since Jesus was someone that was seen. Again, John says in 1 John here, 4th chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. 
For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And then he goes on to say, the one who loves God should love his brother also, which is very, very different thrust than what you see coming out of the mouth of Jesus in Luke 14, where Jesus is teaching about the importance of not having similar love for family members that they would have for him. Now, in verse 33, Jesus goes on to say in this passage, So therefore, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his own possessions. Unless you give up all of your own possessions, you cannot be my disciple. Now, some have taken this literally, like those priests and nuns in the Catholic orders who take vows of poverty. They literally give up everything, ownership of everything. Most understand this to mean that you have to value your possessions less than your discipleship, or to mean that you have to be willing to give up everything, all of your possessions, if necessary. Now, in verses 34 to 35, Jesus concludes this chapter by saying, therefore, Salt is good, but if salt has lost its flavor, with what will it be seasoned? And he says, it is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, it is not clear at all what his point is. It's not clear at all what Jesus in, is intending to say. And you can tell this because there are numerous interpretations among Christian commentaries, numerous different interpretations. Now, there is a famous passage in the Talmud in Tractate Bechoros 8b that takes a very different view on this topic, in a sense, than Jesus does. Jesus again says, that if salt spoils, it's useless, it has to be thrown out. So in this passage in the Talmud, there are a series of debates between the wise men of Athens and the great sage Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hanania. And they challenge him to uh, a number of, in a sense, uh, obscure kinds of questions. And in one of their exchanges, they say, when salt spoils, with what do you preserve it? That's what they ask him. When salt spoils, with what do you preserve it? And he answers them, with the afterbirth of a mule. With the afterbirth of a mule. And they say, wait a second. A mule can't have an afterbirth. Mules are sterile. And he shoots back and says, well, salt does not spoil meaning that their whole question was, when salt spoils, what do you preserve it with? He says, salt does not s spoil. And so Jesus here is claiming that salt can spoil, it can become useless, has to be thrown out. But the sage, Yoshua ben Hanania says here, no, salt does not spoil, never goes bad. Okay, that is my take on chapter 14. And that was a great uh -huh. take, might I say. Myself? <laughs> <laughs> so very good. All right. Well, uh, you guys know where to find us uh, each week. Uh, we'll see you same time, same place at Shim Willing next week for uh, Luke chapter 15. Wow. So, yeah, we're moving, um, moving right along. Yeah, so we're going to be having, starting this Wednesday night, the holiday of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. Oh, right, right. And so um, for Ooh. everyone that's celebrating uh, and observing this incredible holiday of joy. I'll wish everyone a Chag Sameach, a, a wonderful uh, festival of joy. And uh, we should all only have good news this year. Last year was a very difficult time at this time. Sure. Um, God willing, in the coming year, we should only hear good news. Amen. 
I mean, uh, so Robert, will that mean uh, will you be available for? Uh, yeah, because the holiday is basically Thursday and Friday, right? And then it's followed by Shabbat. Sunday is um, what we call Chol Hamoed. It's the intermediary days uh, from Sunday up until again next Wednesday night. Awesome. Um, when the last days of Sukkot. Um, of Shemini Atzeret and Simchat Torah happen, but next Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday until the evening are intermediary days where, yes, we will be in action. Very good to know. Very good to know. Okay, awesome. Well, that sounds good. Well, you should have a, a wonderful, blessed week and tell your wife thank you again uh, for lending you to us so many times. And uh, we hope to see uh, you all again next week. And Chag uh, everybody. Take care. Shalom. Shalom, My dear shalom. friends, hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Shafa